So I'm going to talk uh, uh, about the current strategies in the management of uh, functional mitral regurgitation. And uh, my talk will be uh, basically based on the uh, 2012 uh, version of the guidelines of the management of valvular heart disease uh, of the uh, European uh, Society of Cardiology and the European Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery, and uh, also on the uh, 2014 American guideline for the management of patients with uh, uh, valvular heart disease, which has been uh, recently published online uh, on uh, circulation. Uh, as you all know, uh, functional or secondary mitral regurgitation is characterized by normal or close to normal valve morphology. And the insufficiency of the valve is due to uh, ventricular problems. Actually, it's not a valve problem, it's a ventricular disease. And the insufficiency results from changes in uh, left ventricular geometry, papillary muscle dislocation, leaflet tethering, annular dilatation, decreased closing forces, particularly in those patients who have a very poor left ventricular function, and of course, uh, the synchrony contraction in the great majority of patients. You see, you see here two important parameters for functional mitral regurgitation, the tenting area and the coaptation depth uh, reflecting the severity of tethering of the leaflets. <laughs> Functional mitral regurgitation <coughs> is actually a disease which is uh, um, particularly <coughs> in patients with uh, dilated uh, cardiomyopathy. There is an inverse relationship between the uh, ejection fraction <coughs> and the prevalence of mitral regurgitation, as you can see here in this uh, rather old study, but uh, telling us that essentially functional mitral regurgitation is uh, a disease of cardiomyopathy. And uh, the, the <clears throat> etiology of functional mitral regurgitation uh, reflects the, the etiology of dilated cardiomyopathy for the majority of patients is ischemic in origin and uh, non-idiopathic <clears throat> cardiomyopathy <clears throat> is present only in one third of the patients. So mainly patients with functional mitral regurgitation have uh, ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. Mitral regurgitation is producing a vicious circle because uh, the regurgitation creates uh, volume overload and volume overload produces annular ventricular dilatation and this is worsening mitral regurgitation. Uh, in regard to the ventricle, <coughs> the increased load and stress is producing damage to the ventricle and therefore the dysfunction of the left ventricle, heart failure, and this also is a vicious circle. And uh, this vicious circle is, exp is um, actually telling us why the impact uh, of mitral regurgitation is so bad on the prognosis of the patient. Here are two classical papers of many, many years ago showing the uh, unfavorable impact of mitral regurgitation on the natural history of the patient. This is the classical LAMAS paper showing that some degree of mitral, regur of mitral regurgitation is impacting enormously the survival of patients. The same here, the Grigioni paper from the Mayo Clinic is showing that the presence of mitral regurgitation is uh, affecting the uh, survival of patients. And of course the survival is proportional to the degree of uh, uh, mitral regurgitation. If the mitral regurgitation is severe, certainly the prognosis is uh, worse. Let's start to talk about the indication for mitral valve surgery in secondary mitral regurgitation and look at the guidelines. Surgery is indicated in patients with severe mitral regurgitation undergoing capture. And of course, when the left ventricular ejection fraction is not uh, too bad. And this is uh, a recommendation class uh, one. So certainly, these patients need uh, to be uh, operated under this uh, condition. Surgery should be considered in patients with moderate mitral regurgitation undergoing carbs. This is a little bit more controversial, but actually the opinion of the task force was in favor of uh, surgery. As a matter of fact, if we look, at, for instance, uh, at the stitcher trial patients, uh, uh, quite uh, a large number of patients had uh, some degree of uh, mitral regurgitation. 
the decision to treat mitral valve during capture in these patients was, le was left to the, the surgeon. So these are uh, observational data. But you can see from these observational data that the mortality ra rate is much is uh, different uh, uh, and uh, is much better in patients who also received uh, mitral valve surgery in combination with the uh, capture. So this is uh, uh, an important aspect. But also, we have not only observational data, but we have a randomized trial, the RIME trial, uh, showing us uh, that uh, is, um, if we add mitral valve surgery to CABG, we can have a better results in, term, in terms of primary endpoint, uh, like uh, uh, peak oxygen consumption, so functional capacity is better in patients who receive mitral valve surgery, this one year after. Also, the remodeling uh, of the left ventricle is, uh, is better. The, the size of the, of the, ven, ven, of the left ventricle is, is decreasing, and also BNP is uh, uh, significantly decreased in patients who receive mitral valve surgery compared with patients who only receive uh, um, the capture uh, operation. Uh, in patients with uh, moderate uh, mitral regurgitation, it is important to, um, uh, <coughs> to do an exercise uh, test. Patients who respond with uh, dyspnea um, have a prognosis which is worse, and patients who developed uh, worsening uh, of the degree of mitral regurgitation under exercise have, have also a worse uh, uh, prognosis. So when we have uh, uh, an exercise test which is uh, in, uh, which is telling us that the mitral regurgitation is increasing is probably a good argument to favor uh, mitral surgery during capture. Another recommendation, this is a two-way recommendation, surgery should be considered in symptomatic patients with severe mitral regurgitation, even in left ventricular ejection fraction very low, if there's an option for revascularization and evidence of viability. It is expected that uh, if uh, viability is there, uh, coronary artery surgery can improve uh, due to hibernating myocardium, it can improve the uh, function of the left ventricle, and in this patient it's certainly worthwhile to proceed uh, with uh, uh, mitral valve surgery as well. Uh, a weaker indication is present when uh, no um, uh, coronary artery vascularization is contemplated. In these patients, uh, the recommendation for surgery, if we do not have to do to add a, a CABG surgery, in this patient recommendation is only 2B, so may be considered, but not is uh, strongly uh, recommended. <coughs> and the reason is that the long-term survival of the surgical repair of secondary mitral regurgitation is not different from the long-term survival of patient receiving medical treatment alone. And this is um, uh, very well reported in this uh, classical paper published many years ago from Ann Arbor, says the um, uh, Dr. Wu and uh, uh, the group of uh, Stephen Bolling. In regard to the type uh, of operation which is offered to this patient, uh, certainly annuloplasty is uh, uh, preferred uh, to uh, mitral valve replacement, at least. Uh, according to this uh, meta-analysis. You see that the repair is favored compared to replacement in terms of uh, uh, mortality. Uh, recently, there was uh, an uh, important uh, revival of mitral valve replacement for functional mitral regurgitation. You see this in, uh, to, published in 2009, uh, a paper from the group of uh, Philippe uh, Pibarot. Um, showing that, uh, after all, uh, uh, replacement of the mitral valve under these circumstances is really not too bad, and they suggest to randomize patients to mitral valve repair and a mitral valve uh, uh, replacement. And this is the, um, the last uh, study, uh, the ACCER studies, which has been uh, recently published uh, uh, mitral valve repair versus replacement for severe ischemic mitral regurgitation. Mitral valve repair consists in undersized annuloplasty and mitral valve replacement uh, consists in uh, uh, um, replacement of the valve with the preservation of subvalvular apparatus. So these are the two groups of, uh, of patients. And what has been shown, and that there was no difference in mortality at one year, 
and uh, the recurrence of mitral regurgitation was much higher in patients submitted to uh, undersized annuloplasty compared uh, with patients who had uh, valve replacement. I think that uh, this, uh, this uh, paper, this study, deserves uh, uh, a lot of criticism. Uh, somebody is telling that it's like to randomize pa patient with uh, lung cancer to lobectomy and pneumonectomy. And uh, this is really crazy to do that because it depends very much on the uh, characteristics uh, of the basal condition of the patient, the anatomy of the patient, and so on. We know now very well which are the predictors of recurrent secondary mitral regurgitation under, under, uh, after undersized annuloplasty. And these predictors are, uh, lif um, are listed here, left ventricular and diastolic, uh, and so on. This is the Leiden group. Uh, Robert de Jong is uh, certainly uh, telling us this, uh, the systolic tenting area, the coaptation distance more than 10, posterior leaflet annular plane angle more than 45, distal anterior leaflet annular plane angle more than 50, 25, and systolic interpapillary mass distance more than 20, and systolic sphericity index uh, more than 0 0.7. When we have these things uh, uh, present in that patient, we know since the very beginning that these patients are going to do poorly after um, um, uh, undersized annuloplasty, and these are the candidates for uh, mitral valve replacement. Uh, so we have really to distinguish the type of patient we are dealing with and to uh, give the proper treatment to uh, each category of patient. Another criticism of the study is that they only are considering uh, mitral valve repair with the undersized annuloplasty and nothing else. Uh, on the other hand, we know that uh, uh, mitral repair can benefit from other additional procedures uh, during uh, mitral valve surgery. For instance, if there is uh, um, uh, some uh, important scars of the ventricle, left ventricular application or resection can be indicated in addition, leaflet extension can be carried out in rare instances, but somebody, uh, some, uh, in some occasion can be useful. Secondary cordial resection can be always, can be sometimes useful. For, for, for instance, when we have the Siegel uh, effect and uh, uh, echocardiographically is very well visible, papillary muscle repositioning can be also uh, a good addition to uh, annuloplasty. Um, there are many ways to, uh, to perform that, but these uh, cardiac support devices and occasionally the edge to edge technique can be useful. So a number of additional procedures to help with mitral valve uh, repair. So the results which have been found in the Acker study uh, are in a way a little bit expected because they put all patients, a different patient all together, and therefore we cannot expect a very clear result out uh, of that. But patients um, uh, with uh, uh, functional mitral regurgitation can be um, at risk uh, if uh, surgery is conventional surgery is uh, carried out. If we have an increasing age, old patients, we have a number of comorbidities. If the left ventricular function is uh, severe, then the surgical risk can be very high. And you see here the surgical risk in red going up, going up to the point that the clinical benefit that you see here in green at a certain point doesn't exist anymore. So these patients here, uh, Robert, we are talking about that before also in my talk, previous talk, these patients here for whom there's no surgical option, these patients can be really uh, offered uh, the uh, clipper procedure. And this is the precise suggestion. Of course, the class is only 2B, but this is the precise suggestion of the guidelines. The percutaneous mite clip procedure may be considered in patients with symptomatic, severe, secondary mitral regurgitation despite often medical treatment, including a CRT if indicated, who fulfill the ACO criteria of eligibility, are judged inoperable or at high surgical risk by a team of cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, and who have a life expectancy more than one year. So this must be really the type of patients we can, um, um, uh, in whom we can apply uh, the CLIP procedure. The American guidelines are a little bit uh, less aggressive. See, there is no uh, class one indication. 
Even patients with the chronic severe secondary mitral regurgitation undergoing capture or other procedures, the indication is uh, class 2A. So uh, the Americans are really less aggressive in this. And also, uh, you see another difference with the European guidelines is uh, for patients with chronic, moderate, secondary mitral regurgitation who are undergoing other cardiac surgery. In the European guidelines, this is a 2A indication, and here is only 2B indication. So this is the algorithm, the guidelines, uh, or the American guidelines, and you see here for secondary mitral regurgitation, the maximum that you can give to these patients in mitral valve surgery indication remains to be. And uh, as we told before, the Americans do not consider, uh, just because it's not approval for the clinical use, they're not considered the mitral creep uh, under these uh, circumstances. Uh, I presume that uh, there's a lot of expectation for the reshape heart failure um, study and for the co-op study uh, comparing patients with heart failure and functional mitral regurgitation treated with optical medical treatment alone or optical medical treatment plus the mitral clip. There's a lot of expectation for these studies, but from, um, from the very beginning it looks that it's very difficult to randomize patients and uh, since the beginning of the last year, for instance, here in Europe, only 25 patients, about 25 patients have been randomized. And uh, in the study, we expect to randomize about 800 patients. So it's very, very difficult to randomize patients uh, because uh, there's a tendency to use the mitral clip anyway. Uh, for the co-op study, probably things are different because there is a strong motivation in America to randomize because the procedure is not available. So only after uh, the result of this study will be possible to have the approval and uh, uh, to have this uh, uh, procedure at the disposal. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> well, Otavio, thank you for this uh, very uh, comprehensive uh, treatment of a very controversial issue. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, I would encourage our young Russian colleagues to put questions. Uh, you should not be afraid about the language. We have translation, and uh, you're really welcome to uh, to give extra explanation if you if you want it. Otavio, while the young colleagues of Russia are preparing their question, I would like to reemphasize what you told about this uh, study, the prospective randomized study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, because I was a little bit. Uh, stimulated by the remark of uh, <coughs> Lars Fenson this morning who said that uh, we, should not, uh, we should not even try or su suggesting that probably the best treatment was replacement. I think this is a very uh, important argument what you gave is that the only technique was annuloplasty <coughs> and not only the only technique was annuloplasty but they did it on a very special way because 33% of recurrent martial regurgitation after six months is enormous. Uh, we have published in Leiden and <clears throat> the same in our department. We have about 13, 15% after 48 months. So there must be something in the way that they were doing the, 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 the restrictive annuloplasty. But another point is that if you look at the paper in the cohort of patients uh, having recurrent martial regurgitation compared to, in the court of patients having had a mitral uh, valve repair, restrictive annuloplasty, they compared the patients having no recurrence in six months with patients having recurrence in six months, and they found a very important difference in remodeling. So it means that if you put correctly the indication of mitral valve repair, it is still much better than anything else. The total paper says there is no difference between replacement and repair. But if you manage to do a repair because you have a better indication or because you use more techniques or a better techniques, it is much better than the mitral, uh, the mitral valve replacement. And in the late uh, AATS, I was discussing of the paper of Earth Crown, and you have presented to us, uh, I think, seven or eight factors. He found after a multivariate analysis 10 predictors 
And if you use that, maybe we're going to have a sort of algorithm. And if this patient fit into this algorithm, he should have a repair. If he doesn't fit, he should have a replacement. What, what do you think about, about this, uh, this comment? Yeah, it's, uh, it's exactly what, um, what I tried to, to say, that is uh, basically there are uh, different uh, patients with uh, different anatomical features, uh, different clinical conditions, and I think it is very important to identify those factors uh, who can uh, predict a poor outcome uh, with uh, uh, mitral valve repair. And nowadays we have enough data in the literature and the experience of everybody to identify those patients. And of course, this, those patients have to be treated with mitral valve replacement. Sure. So the message is not that mitral valve replacement is the same. The message is that we should better indicate and select the patients and the technique for mitral valve repair, and then we will have a better ratio. I welcome you, please, for your question. Rustam Vraev, Moscow. Vopros takoy, kak vy atnostis k anuloplastiki mehkim apornim kaltom? I vtaro vopros sravnili vy žoski apor? Kak vy atnostis? You are talking about the ring, rigid or soft? That that was the. The question. Can you repeat the question, maybe? Yeah. Как вы относитесь к пластике мягким опорным кольцом и проводили ли вы сравнение мягкие опорные кольца по сравнению с жесткими? Спасибо. Oh yes, this is seems to be rather well known that is preferable in the functional mitral regurgitation to use complete rigid rings, and maybe is also convenient to use. Rings uh, with a particular shape according to the position of the regurgitant jet. So this is what is commonly accepted, accepted, and there are data to support uh, this statement. Otavio, <coughs> like uh, many others, I was very disappointed with these results, who equalized valve replacement and valve repair. <clears throat> it, uh, you have pointed out that it is not the only solution uh, under size adenoplasty. Uh, I personally be believe that the reason for these uh, poor results is that the, most of the people are trained to repair a degener degenerative mitral valve, which is much, much easier than the one we have seen before, which is a much more complex reconstruction, which going into the ventricle, it uh, uh, cordal support, uh, secondary cord, uh, papillary muscle, so this is probably the reason that people didn't know how to do it properly. Yeah, you are very right, Marco. It's a, it's a very naive, naive procedure just uh, to put a simple ring. Uh, everybody can do an undersized uh, ring. But uh, if, we want, if somebody wants really to do a proper mitral valve repair in the, concept of, in the context of ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, we should also address uh, the subvalvular apparatus, for instance. And this is, uh, is not a simple procedure to be carried out, and this requires a lot of experience. And uh, also the result of this, you know, if you, if you decide to pull up the papillary muscle, it's very difficult to know how much uh, you have to do that, because um, the, the, the waterproof, the test uh, with the saline injection in the left ventricle doesn't help too much. Uh, I, am, uh, I like very much the technique suggested by, by Joachim Schaffer, for instance, uh, which is uh, pulling up the papillary muscle under echocardiographic uh, control uh, immediately postoperatively. And that uh, he can exactly know uh, very well how much he has to pull up because he can, uh, he can see the coaptation, the absence of mitral regurgitation, and the length of coaptation of the two leaflets, and that can adjust exactly the, the pulling of the papillary muscles. Well, I, I want to stress that we should not condemn the restrictive anuloplasty. I think uh, if you respect the criteria of selection, and if you respect, for instance, what we published about the end diastolic diameter less than 65, I think you can be quite reproducible in only restrictive mitral aneuroplasty in most of the patients. We should not give the impression that by definition the treatment of ischemic mitral regurgitation is a very complicated issue, but you should know when you can use only the restrictive and when you have to add uh, uh, under uh, androventricular uh, 
uh, issues. Personally, I always try to have an end point. At the end of the operation, if, if you have put a restrictive annuloplasty in a ventricle which is not more than 65 millimeter and diastolic dimension, I like to have a coaptation length of 8 millimeter. If you do not have that, you have an unstable repair. So I think we should not condemn the simple restrictive material neuroplasty in ischemic material regurgitation. Other we, otherwise, we're going to reserve that for very experienced surgeons. I think we should, we should tell the young surgeons doing coronary surgery that if you respect the criteria, you still can be successful in selected patients with only restrictive material neuroplasty. Would you be agree with that? Okay, I agree with that. <clears throat> But you know, if you, if you look exactly at how many patients can benefit uh, from the pure annuloplasty, undersized annuloplasty without anything else, uh, you know, how many patients have a diastolic diameter of less than 65, then you will realize immediately that the number is, is not so huge, you know, it's, uh, it's rather small. Yes, Leo? Uh, I have a question of interest. So, uh, if you have a patient with a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and um, uh, he has a moderate insufficiency, let's say he has enlarged up to 38, 40 millimeters uh, mitral valve, 40, 42 millimeters tricuspid valve, uh, uh, he is doing more or less well, okay, in between. What will be the recommendations for those <coughs> patients yeah, yeah, this Digi is, uh, digoxin or you know very important uh, very important question you know in the context of these patients with uh, reduced ventricular function mitral regurgitation uh, the presence of uh, uh, atrial fibrillation is deleterious on the on the natural history it's yeah, yes uh, you're right and then uh, so for sure, uh, let, let's uh, go uh, step by step. For sure, if I, if I have a patient with a severe mitral regurgitation, poor ventricular function, and atrial fibrillation, I will try hard to um, get away with atrial fibrillation to do the maze in association because we have seen and demonstrated, we have data on that, I didn't show, but we have data on that, that they recover much better ventricular function and so on, so on. So if there's a place we are to use almost obligatory use the 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 uh, atrial fibrillation surgery is probably in this type of patient. Now the case that you you have proposed is a little bit borderline because this is a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and then uh, maybe you can uh, you, you you don't know exactly if it's going to develop the permanent uh, atrial fibrillation or persistent atrial fibrillation and so on. If it is uh, Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, it, it takes so little just uh, during surgery to add uh, an encircling with the uh, radiofrequency ablation. To the, and I would do the, the encircling of uh, pulmonary veins. This is my, what I would do personally. 